Three weeks after her wedding day, Susan called her friend in hysterics. John and I had our first fight together. It was awful. What am I going to do? She asked. Calm down, Susan, her friend answered. It's not as bad as you think. Every marriage has to have its first fight. It's natural. I know, I know, said Susan impatiently, but what am I going to do with the body? (laughs) Now, I hope, (laughs) sorry, I hope that none of us would ever do anything like that. Of course not. But I think we laugh because we all agree how difficult relationships can really be. Disagreement, conflict, breakup can come into all of our relationships. Doesn't matter what relationship we think of, whether it's husbands and wives, children and parents, between friends, colleagues, neighbours, or even between brothers and sisters in Christ. All of these can experience brokenness. And that can bring incredible pain and hurt into our lives. And over the last two years, many people have experienced this more than ever before. There was a survey carried out by the University College London and it found that a quarter of people said that their relationship with their spouse or their partner has deteriorated over COVID. Just being in the house together all that time with added pressure just was not good for relationships. Another survey from Wales, they said that 42% of of them were finding their partners irritating. And 36% were were arguing more. And sometimes that can get really serious. Many domestic abuse helplines have seen a dramatic increase in the calls that they've received. And in the States, there was a large website, a legal website, that announced that they'd seen a 34% increase in sales of their divorce agreements. So many people are struggling with broken relationships. And yet I think also during this pandemic, we've again been reminded of just how important those relationships are. During this time of of lockdowns and social distancing and mask wearing and all of that, we've really missed being able to meet with people. Being able to have a a face-to-face conversation, even just having an experience of human touch. It's been really tough, because relationships are so vital. As God said in Genesis chapter 2, it's not good for the man to be alone. We We don't do well in isolation. We were designed for relationships. In fact, there was in a TED talk a few years ago, a woman called Susan Pinker. She talked about the Italian island of Sardinia. How it had ten times the proportion of centenarians, people over the age of a hundred, than they did in the North America. And she claimed that this was not because of their better diet or their sunny climate, but it was because of the quality of their close personal relationships and their face-to-face interactions. We thrive in relationships and we don't do well outside of them. So relationships are so difficult and yet they're so vital. So how can we face the giant of broken relationships? What can we do to resolve conflict when it arises? Or how can we cope? when those resolutions don't happen. Well, we're going to look again at the life of David and we're going to see what lessons we can learn. And Bran's going to come and he's going to read uh, to us and we're reading from 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 1 to 18. Hi, good morning. Is it working? Good morning. Good morning. (laughs) <laughs> oh, <clears throat> so listening to this statistics that uh, Andrew said about COVID quarantine, looking back on my life, looks like Evelyn and I have been. Uh, oh, 
Looks like Kevin and I have been in COVID quarantine for a couple of years now. Because, <laughs> right. <clears throat> Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had, had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I found out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took took this oath. As surely as Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before. Once more war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. The night David made, this, <coughs> sorry, that night David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through the through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the man back to see David and told told him, Bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the man entered, there was was an idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul has done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Nath and stayed there. Thank you very much, Abraham, for reading for us. As we saw last week, Saul was incredibly jealous of David's success and as a result his desire to get rid of David just increased more and more before he kind of lashed out in a kind of fit of rage and anger trying to kill David and then he'd kind of schemed to try and get the Philistines to kill him but now he just ordered this direct attack Saul told his son Jonathan and all his attendants to kill David Now, David had done nothing to deserve this. He'd served Saul by playing his heart for him when he was troubled. He had defeated Goliath when Saul was paralyzed with fear. And he'd been serving in his army. And yet, despite all of this, here he was with a death sentence hanging over him. And that's the first thing I think we should realize here. Relationships in our lives Brokenness in our relationship in our lives is inevitable. This is what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We are called, of course, to be loving and patient, to be caring and to be considerate. But even if we, tr- we try to do everything right, Sometimes living at peace with everyone is just not possible. Whatever we do, some of our relationships will break. 
And we can know this because this is what happened to Jesus. He was always perfectly loving. Always spoke the truth. Always did what was right. And yet he too faced rejection and hatred. He came to that which was his own, John writes in John chapter 1. But his own did not receive him. Jesus never did anything wrong, and yet many of his followers abandoned him. One of his disciples denied him. Another betrayed him. And his people crucified him. So if this happened to the perfect Son of God, then we mustn't be surprised if it happens to us. Broken relationships are not always our fault. They don't always mean that we've done something wrong. Because in this fallen and mixed up world, they are kind of inevitable in our lives. So despite David doing nothing wrong, Saul ordered Jonathan to kill David. But look at verse 1 and 2. But but Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him. Jonathan didn't follow his father's orders. Of course, he wasn't jealous of David. And he wasn't afraid to resist his dad, even though his dad was king. So instead, Jonathan courageously risked everything to warn David about this threat to his life. Broken relationships in this world are inevitable. But that doesn't mean it's okay for us to contribute to that. It doesn't mean it's okay for us just to go along with the wrongs that are done. It doesn't mean it's okay for us just to hurt anybody because, well, it's going to happen anyway. This is what Paul wrote to the, the church in Ephesus. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Have nothing to do with them. We need to have the courage in this world to stand out from the crowd and be different. To go against the flow. To seek to do what is right. Even if it puts us in the firing line. That's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 1 and 17. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. So in love, Jonathan did not go along with his dad. Instead, he warned David. But that's not all that Jonathan did here. He also spoke up for him. Look at verse 4. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. Now this was a really dangerous thing to do for Jonathan. In the next chapter, chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, when Jonathan did this again, Saul got so angry that he actually hurled a spear at his son Jonathan and tried to kill him. But Jonathan was willing to do this because he believed it was the right thing to do. He stood in between Saul and David. And he sought to mediate between the two of them. He carefully spoke the truth into this heated situation. He reminded Saul of David's innocence. How he'd killed Goliath and won a great victory for the people of Israel. He also reminded Saul that actually he'd been really pleased when David had done that in the first place. So Jonathan spoke courageously and carefully and calmly into that situation. And amazingly, Saul listened. He promised, verse 6, As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. When relationships break down, when wrongs are done, when hurts are caused, I think it can be tempting just to try and keep our head down. 
just to stay silent. Wait for things just to fall apart. Not, not get involved. None of us loved stepping into that kind of conflict and that kind of problem, those kind of problems. But Jesus didn't call us to be silent. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said this, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. If possible, if it's wise, if it's safe to do so, when we are wronged, we should make the first move to graciously confront the one who's hurt us. You know, we may be innocent in that situation, but we are called to do what we can to resolve that broken relationship. Now, that might not always work. So Jesus went on to say, verse 16 of Matthew 18, but if you will not listen, take one or two others along. Sometimes we cannot sort matters out on our own. Maybe the issue is too messy. Maybe someone has just been really stubborn and, re- and refusing to see the truth. But it's then that we need other people to be willing to step into that situation, to speak into that conflict, to work to mediate between those two parties, to stand in the gap and seek to bring people together. Now, that's not easy. Of course it's not. It's tempting just to stay out of those really messy situations. We know like Jonathan, sometimes stepping into them, you might end up being the one who gets attacked. But this is what we are called to do. Because this is what Jesus did. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 5 says this. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Because of our sin, we were enemies of God. We were rebelling against His rule and His reign in our lives. But Jesus stepped into that situation at great cost to himself. He took the price of our sin and he paid for it in full so that we could be reconciled to God. And so if we've trusted in Jesus this morning, if we've turned from our sin and put our faith in him as the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our lives, then we've been brought into peace with God. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. We're now His children. We are now forgiven. We are now cleansed. We're now adopted into His family. And if that is the case, Now, we're not just called to enjoy that peace, to enjoy that formed relationship and to to experience all of what that means. We're also commissioned to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and seek to bring others into it. To help them to be reconciled, first and foremost, to God, of course but also work to seek to help people to be reconciled to others. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. We show our likeness to Jesus when we work to mend broken relationships. So we shouldn't be silent in those messy situations. We're not called to stand back and just to look after ourselves. 
Instead, we're called to step into those situations. To lovingly confront sin. To speak the truth graciously. And seek to work to call people to reconciliation. This is what Jonathan did. But really that reconciliation was only possible because David was willing to forgive. Jonathan told David what what had been said, the promise that Saul had made not to kill him. And then, verse 7, then he brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. As, As we said earlier, this wasn't the first time that Saul had threatened David's life. But David didn't hold a grudge. He didn't fight back and try and get revenge for all the hassles and the pain that Saul had caused him. Instead, he responded with forgiveness and grace. He came back not only into that relationship with Saul, but actually to serve Saul again. To fight his battles for him. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Then Jesus goes on to say this. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Grace upon grace upon grace. In this world, we are not to to hold on to a grudge. Instead, if people are willing to repent, then our responsibility is to be willing to forgive. Why is that? Why have we, as God's people, been called to be people who are always willing to forgive when somebody comes and repents? Well, it's because we've been forgiven so much. Paul says in Colossians 3.13, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Why do we have to forgive? Well, because we've been forgiven so much. Again and again and again. And so this is the transforming power of the gospel. By God's amazing grace, we've been reconciled to God. And through that grace, we can be reconciled to others. So the gospel has the power to restore broken marriages, to reconcile bitter enemies, to mend fractured families, and even to unite people from all walks of life into the body of Christ. So this morning, folks, whatever broken situation that we are facing, whatever circumstance that just looks impossible to us, we can pray for God to work to bring about reconciliation. Pray that by His Spirit, He will soften hardened hearts and He will bring people to repentance and that He'll give us the grace and the love and the compassion that we need to offer full and free forgiveness. It's by God's grace we can overcome the brokenness of our relationships. But we also need to be aware that in this broken world, every broken relationship will not be mended. Sometimes, we might even just need to walk away. Again, Saul's mind was disturbed. And in a rage, he had that spear, he loved that spear. And he hurled that spear at David again, as David played the harp for him. David managed to duck out of the way, and that night David made good his escape. David initially went home to his wife, Michal, 
and but so Saul sent soldiers there to lie in wait to kill him. But Michal, who was also a child of Saul, he, she heard about it, and like Jonathan before her, she protected David. David escaped through a, a window while she covered for him. First with an idol in his bed, and then with a lie about him being sick. By the time that deception had been discovered, David had fled. And David would never be reconciled to Saul ever again. And sometimes in our lives, we too have to leave. Yes, we can be here to celebrate the power and the grace of God to reconcile enemies. But we also need to face up to the reality of this world. Sometimes relationships this side of eternity will not be fixed. Jesus said this after teaching that step-by-step process of how to deal with when a brother sins against us, go go your own, bring two or three witnesses, take it to the church. Jesus said this, verse 17 of Matthew 18, and if he refuses to listen, even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan and a tax collector. If after doing everything we can to bring about repentance and reconciliation, sometimes we need to accept that we just can't do anymore. We need to let go. And leave that person in God's hands. Now, knowing when that time has come is, of course, really difficult. And it very much depends on the person we're dealing with and the relationship we have with them and what role they have in our lives and all of that. So it's a complex issue. It's not a straightforward step one, two, three, four. Okay, that's it. It requires a lot of wisdom to work through these issues and and specifically in each of the different situations we might respond slightly differently. But this is the principle. This is the reality. Because of the the reality of sin in this world, because of the hardness of hearts, some of our relationships might stay broken. Remember we read that in Romans chapter 12? If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes we've done everything we can to live at peace. And we can't do any more. Sometimes other people will walk away. Sometimes we might need to leave for the sake of the gospel. Or even for our own safety. We need to just accept that we can't always stay. But last of all, did you notice what David did when he ran away? Look at verse 18. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Saul at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done for him. When we've been badly hurt, when we've been let down by others, sometimes the temptation is just to cut ourselves off from everybody else. We just feel, well, that these people have hurt us so much, I really just don't want to step into any other situation because they'll just get hurt again. But David didn't do that here. Instead of just running off on his own, he ran to Samuel. And he trusted Samuel that Samuel could help him in that situation. And in this world of broken relationships, we need to resist that temptation to isolate, to separate from everybody. Yes, some people will fail us. Some people will hurt us. Some people will reject us. But we can't go it alone. We need to keep on trusting people. We need to keep on letting people in. Because we need fellowship. 
writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. So we need each other. Even when it's hard. Even when we've been hurt. But there's something that we need more than that. Someone that we need more than that. More than fellowship with others, we need fellowship with the Lord. It was great that David had Jonathan and Michal and Samuel. They did step in to help and to protect him in that situation. But ultimately, David overcame because the Lord was with him. It was God who was watching over him. It was God who delivered him. It was God who gave him the strength that he needed. And David knew that. Because that's what he wrote in one of his psalms that he composed at this time. Psalm 59. Verse 17 says this. You can have a look at the whole psalm later if you want. Verse 17 says, O my strength, I sing praise to you. You, O God, are my fortress, my loving God. And that is what we need more than anything else. In a world where we'll experience so many broken relationships, we need to keep on going back to the one who will always be faithful to us. To the one who will never give up on us. The one who will never turn their back on us. The one who will never stop loving us. We need to keep on going to the one, the only one, who can truly promise never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So this is how we can face the giant of broken relationships in our lives. Don't be surprised. Brokenness is inevitable. Don't go with the flow. Continue to do what is right. Don't be silent. Speak up and seek peace. Don't hold a grudge. Forgive as we've been forgiven. Don't always stay. Because sometimes we will have to leave. But don't be alone. Because we need each other. And more than anything else, we need the Lord.